Welcome to the uh, Crestrian Canada National Equine Disease and Welfare Surveillance Call. Um, I, you probably gathered I'm not Dr. Melanie Barham. <laughs> it's a, a way this week. Uh, I'm Doug Orr. I'm, I co-chair the Health and Welfare Committee with Dr. Barham. And uh, so I'll just be chairing the, the, uh, the meeting this morning. Uh, just a couple of uh, business items uh, for folks who are new uh, to the call or may just need a reminder about how our surveillance call works. Uh, we have a number of speakers, uh, again, this morning who are going to present some information to everyone. Um, we will mute the lines while the presentation is going on so that everyone can hear. And then uh, we'll ask people to um, save their questions for the end of all of the presentations. And then we will open the line up uh, for discussions and questions. Uh, that expedites the, uh, the morning and ensures that uh, we cover all of the things that need to be covered. And then it also assists us uh, in uh, editing call for uh, for uh, posting later on, uh, which is the other reminder is that this call is being recorded. And uh, when we're done, Christy will edit the uh, the, the uh, surveillance call and um, post it up online on the EC website, and you can attend it uh, later. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Um, the uh, first person who is going to present this morning and I get, will remind the presenters, uh, when you do need to speak, uh, just uh, star six will unmute your line. And uh, when you're done, star six will mute it again, which is helpful if you have any background noise for keeping the call clear. Um, so our, our first um, presenter this morning uh, is an update on uh, the Canadian uh, Animal Health Surveillance System. Um, and uh, Cheryl James from CFIA, I think, is going to speak to that. So I'll hand that over to Cheryl. And just a reminder that star six will unmute your line, Cheryl. I, I'm here, I think. Can you hear me? <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Well, um, I'm sitting in for uh, Keith Merch this, this month. Just to uh, remind you, Keith is, is still working with us and working as uh, in, in support of the Equine Health Surveillance Network under CAS. Uh, but he is, uh, he's reduced his Time of working to two days a week uh, for the for the next uh, few months. Uh, so I'll be uh, helping out uh, when I can. Uh, the Equine Network has been working um, a lot on uh, notifiable diseases. Um, just as a reminder, that's one of the the key objectives of the network was to to be able to share information on disease occurrences when and as they happen. Um, and, and to get that information from a reliable source. So we have been working with the provinces and the uh, Council of Chief Veterinary Officers for each province and um, uh, trying to get some cooperation on, on this real-time reporting of diseases when and as they happen. Um, we are, from the, from the perspective of the CFIA, there are some diseases that are reported to the CFIA, so they certainly... Um, Equine infectious anemia is being reported by uh, Carolyn James of the CFIA. She is reporting that directly to the website when and as it occurs. And um, we also have um, uh, what we discovered, we have a very nice database of uh, West Nile virus and equine encephalitis, eastern equine encephalitis. These are immediately notifiable diseases, so when they when they happen, they are reported to the to the, also to the CFIA, um, and uh, we've been working with Julie Paré in, in the CFIA. She has uh, the information within a database, so so we're looking at the potential to to take that information um, for non-identified information, um, so that it doesn't uh, uh, violate anybody's confidentiality, but to to take that and and to be able to post it on the on the CAS website, and that would allow us to get that information out there without creating a, an additional burden for the people in the provinces to to take it and post it there after they've already reported it to the CFIA. So we're also looking at some dashboard technology um, to see if we can use, um, it's called Power BI dashboard. So what it would allow us to do is, is to access, uh, provide access to that non-identified data so that people could go in 
and very easily query the data or maybe do some mapping or you know there's there's any number of things we can do in that so we're we're looking into that as well to see if that's something that might be useful to the network um I'd also like to to mention Teresa is going to be speaking um to the group today and and um just wanted to thank Teresa for for the report on on strangles that um um and that was also posted to to the website so I think that's all I had to say on the notifiable diseases, and that's really where, where we've, been, we've been concentrating our, our effort lately with the equine surveillance network. Um, just to give you a, small, a short update on um, the transition of, of uh, CAS, Canadian Animal Health Surveillance Net, uh, System, to the National Farm and Animal Health and Welfare Council. I believe that we've talked about this previously, but it was um, right now CAS is the coordination of CAS is, is within CFIA and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. The, those two federal government departments agreed to help build CAS, um, but it was never intended that this should be a government initiative. It's intended to be a fed prob industry initiative, so we are transitioning uh, to the National Farm Animal Health and Welfare Council. Uh, Megan Bergman has uh, uh, taken on a position with the council as executive director, and um, uh, she is going to be the key contact point within within the council um, for dealing with CAS. And they're in the process of uh, writing up proposals and looking for for uh, some multi-year funding uh, to continue to support CAS. In the meantime. Uh, we have a commitment from our management here that uh, all the coordinating staff will stay in place here and will be here to help out and, and assist with the network until the, the council is in a position uh, to take over that function. So, and I think that's it. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. That's good. And again, I'll just remind folks that if you have questions, uh, uh, we will save the questions till the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, just to expedite our time and be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, so uh, thanks, Cheryl. And uh, that's a nice segue uh, to Teresa then, uh, who is going to speak to us uh, regarding a Strangles case update from uh, uh, Ontario. Uh, so if you're on the line, Teresa, if you push star six, that will unmute your line. And uh, we'll uh, look forward to hearing from you. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we sure can. That's great. Perfect. So, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, exactly. I would like to just briefly outline um, the case information for a strangled positive horse that um, was identified in the township of North Grenville, Ontario, this September. So uh, the horse in question, she's an eight-year-old quarter horse mare. Uh, she initially presented on uh, the 26th of September uh, with a brief history, well, several days of lethargy and a mild cough. At this time, she did have a normal temperature. Um, she was then seen on emergency uh, the next evening, actually, by a neighboring clinic to us. Um, and for, that was for acute onset of distress with some dyspnea and nasal discharge. At this time, she was pyrexic, a uh, temperature of 40 Celsius. Uh, she was treated at that time for uh, choke. Um, she was started on antibiotics and anti-inflammatories, um, and samples were taken by swabbing the nasal passage and also by performing a nasal pharyngeal wash. Both of these samples uh, were submitted to the animal health lab for a strangled uh, strep equi uh, PCR. Um, the nasal swab tested negative. However, the nasal pharyngeal wash sample uh, did test positive for strep equi, and those results came back to us on October 3rd. Um, as far as we're aware, the mayor uh, is up to date on her basic vaccinations. However, she has not been vaccinated for strangles uh, in her past. Um, she has been housed on the property where she was for at least the past year, and she doesn't regularly leave the premises. However, uh, she was last off the property six weeks prior for recreational group trail riding. Um, also, the facility where she's housed, 
um, where she developed clinical signs is a boarding facility, boarding stable, with um, it houses a combination of recreational riding horses and high-level performance horses, um, and those are of varying disciplines, including English, Western, and driving. Um, there are other horses on the property who um, are and are not vaccinated for strangles a bit of a mixed bag, and some of those horses had recently moved off the property for shows during the summer and during and during the, the late spring. Um, uh, other details are the affected mare um, had been housed in an individual paddock with no shared fence line for months prior to this uh, initial incident, um, and apparently the only contact with other horses would likely have been um, while she was passing through the barn or maybe in the riding ring. Um, so after we received uh, this positive test result, the owner was immediately notified um, and an individual quarantine plan was put in place for her. And this included um, restricting her movement out of her little individual paddock and also ensuring that her caregivers didn't contact other horses on the property. Um, uh, at this time, uh, consent to notify the barn owner and the general equine community of the presence of strangles was obtained from the horse's owner. She was very forthcoming and let us share that information. Um, then, uh, immediately after, um, I contacted the owner of the boarding facility, and on speaking to him, we discussed a quarantine plan um, for the barn as a whole, and we sort of described the different aspects of that. Um, those um, plans were based off of the recommendations made in the um, revised ACVIM Strangles Consensus Statement. Um, so it was recommended also that no horses move on or off the farm until um, all horses with clinical signs could be identified and uh, confirmed negative for strangles uh, once they were recovered, if they did occur. Um, Unfortunately, it was discovered um, through uh, social media and a bit of word of mouth that um, uh, a carriage clinic had actually been held on that very same property the following mm -hmm. weekend. Uh, that was after results were obtained um, and, and everyone was notified. Um, and that specific quarantine protocols that we had laid out had not uh, been followed very well. Um, so uh, this included horses from off-farm had come onto the property to take part in this clinic. Um, so because of this, just uh, it was our goal to sort of maintain some confidentiality, but also to um, try to manage the situation as best we could. Um, so at this point, local vets uh, who had potentially affected clients and, and patients were notified of, of just that potential contact with a strangled positive force or the, the contaminated burn environment where they uh, were or could have been. So. Um, Throughout the weeks that followed, uh, daily temperatures were taken on all the horses on farm, uh, as we kind of talked about and, and was recommended, um, and no individuals with high temperatures or uh, the, the general clinical signs of strangles have been identified, uh, to the best of my knowledge, at this point. So um, only one other horse has been tested for strangles by our clinic. Um, this horse uh, was on that same property. She was owned by the same owner as this index case, um, and she requested the test for her own information, despite uh, this horse not having any clinical signs or fever um, in this whole sort of uh, longer time period. Um, a nasal pharyngeal wash sample was submitted to the lab from this horse, and she did test negative by PCR. Um, also, so the, the Spangles positive mare is, is currently recovering well. She seems to have recovered completely from her basic clinical signs, has temped uh, negative uh, uh, normal um, over the last um, two to three weeks. So we plan to um, perform that additional testing to confirm she strangles negative uh, once her owner's schedule and, and finances allow for that. Um, all told, it's been almost six weeks since the strangled case was identified. Um, and again, no other horses have presented with clinical signs or tested positive for strangles to the best of, of my knowledge. Um, uh, just talking with our um, you know, colleagues in the area um, and being around uh, this area. Um, so yeah, that, that was a, a brief update on this case. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at the end of the call if, if anyone has them. Great. Thank you, Teresa. That's uh, very, very uh, useful information. Thank you. And yeah, just a reminder to everyone that uh, do jot down questions you have for our presenters. And uh, um, at the end of the call, we will open the lines up for uh, for discussion and questions.
Um, Allison, uh, then uh, you were going to give us an update on the Ontario uh, Animal Health Network. Yes, hi. So um, we just finished our uh, quarter three teleconference call. Uh, so it was a couple of weeks ago now. So this, uh, what I'll be talking about is really for July, August, and September of this year. So of note, um, in terms of disease uh, surveillance, we had 13 cases of eastern equine encephalitis. 12 were from the south central part of the province, um, which involves the uh, counties or municipalities of Hamilton, Haldimand, and Niagara. And one was from Prince Edward County towards the eastern end of the province. So the 12 in the south central part, that area is a, was a bit of a, a surprise. We have had cases in Haldeman County back in 2009, but nothing reported since. Um, of the 13 cases that we had, one did survive. Um, none of the horses, uh, save one, were vaccinated, and the one that was was incompletely so, only receiving one vaccine administration. The Our last large uh, outbreak of Tripoli was in 2014, which occurred out in the eastern end of the province, um, where 24 horses were affected, and most of them died or were euthanized. And, of course, I'm only talking about those that are reported, certainly there were more horses this year um, above the 13 that died or were euthanized in the uh, south central part of the province. We also had 11 cases of West Nile virus, uh, three of which were euthanized. None had been vaccinated either ever or in the past few years. This was, again, down from the number that we had reported last year when we had 23 cases, of which 10 were euthanized. Um, again, these are only reported cases, and there were several more that were affected um, that weren't tested. The location of the West Nile cases were along uh, the typical corridor in southwestern Ontario. Um, and interestingly, we didn't have any positives more north, which is more uh, typical, as well as for Tripoli. We tend to get them up uh, in the Muskoka Simcoe area, but we didn't get any reports this year. We had one uh, equine herpes myelencephalopathy reported in Simcoe County in September. Um, the uh, horse that was uh, euthanized um, had neuroscience and severe ataxia. There was another horse in the paddock with it that also had neurological signs but did recover, um, although he has some lingering deficiencies. Uh, biosecurity practices were appropriate and no other horses developed fevers or tested positive on the farm. Other uh, diseases of note, as you've heard from Teresa, we have uh, strangles that continues to percolate around the province, and our um, Ontario Animal Health Network representatives report cases or did report cases in the southwest and eastern parts of the province. Uh, Lyme disease, represented by fever, stiffness, uh, or polyarthritis, and anaplasmosis represented by fever, depression, and low platelet counts were reported in horses by our eastern representatives. As well, uh, Potomac horse fever was diagnosed in various areas of the province once again, and the Ontario Animal Health Network is undertaking a study on the sensitivity of testing procedures on blood versus manure, and we are trying to identify different strains of the bacterium in the province. So. To date, there's been actually several strains that have been identified in this. Uh, when we talk about the efficacy of the vaccination, the vaccination only deals with one of those strains. So although it does provide, most veterinarians that use the vaccine um, claim that it does provide some assistance with decreasing severity of signs and longevity of disease, um, it doesn't target all strains that are out there. As well, uh, typically we had colics, and I, I think all of our representatives noted that there was probably more of them this last quarter due to our up and down weather um, with a variety of surgical and medical colics across the province, but um, not one particular type of colic stood out. And uh, that's all I have. Happy to take questions at the end. Great. Thanks very much, Allison. Um, Charmaine, are you on the uh, call today? Charmaine Bergman? Charmaine here. Oh, hi, Charmaine. Great. We weren't sure if you were on the call or not. That's great. Uh, Charmaine Bergwin uh, uh, is going to update us on some information about uh, warm blood fragile full syndrome, uh, which uh, surfaced on the call a couple of calls ago. And uh, Charmaine's got some updates for us. I'll hand that over to you, Charmaine. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. 
Um, I sent a short note around for you guys to have it in writing as well. Um, at this, it was been a very interesting thing because initially when this raised its head, um, everything was uh, being done out of labs in the state, a lab out of the state. Then a second lab uh, started to do it, and we were looking for a Canadian lab. Um, as it turns out, apparently Cornell, who was the originator of the test, uh, did not patent it in Canada, and we just found that out in the last two weeks. So, um, Rolf apparently um, is in the it has been in the development stages for the test. Uh, Maxim was waiting because uh, they thought they couldn't even look at it due to patent. So, I guess we may end up having two labs in Canada that will be able to do this genetic test within the next few months. Um, because certainly it's not just Canadian warm blood horses. Um, it, it's titled warm blood fragile soul syndrome. Um, the reality is, though, that uh, we see it in other breeds, um, including thoroughbreds. Um, and because this has kind of come to the table and, uh, in, you know, um, public social media, uh, it became very large very quickly. Um, so even the data information, um, because there was so little testing done initially, uh, is still out there as to where it's coming from, uh, what all breeds are actually in, uh, carrying it. So at this point, it's, it's kind of interesting, considering this isn't what I normally do, but it's kind of interesting to see how something like a double recessive comes up and, and then trying to track where it may have come from or where it may be seen. Um, so this time our association is working with our registrar, which is Canada Livestock Records Corp, uh, just to get um, the paperwork and, you know, to, to offer the test to our members. Um, but like I said, we're not mandating the genetic test. We are definitely recommending it, so, though, so that people can make um, decisions based on fact, not rumor. Um, so that's about where we're at. Uh, so we'll, um, you know, we really wanted a Canadian lab because we would like to confirm parentage of the animals uh, through the te when they're being tested. Uh, so that Sally Sue really is Sally Sue uh, and not Sally Mo. So that's about where we're at. It's still a, it's still a bit of a dance, um, but very exciting that Canadian labs are going to be able to to offer this to the equine population in Canada. That's it. Great. Thanks, Charmaine. That's uh, very useful information, very helpful. Thank you, and we'll uh, continue to uh, ensure that the, the, the larger community is aware, aware of that information. So thank you so much. Uh, and, again, if you have questions for Charmaine, we'll, uh, we'll take them at the end of the call. Uh, uh, Susan, are you on the, um, on the call yet uh, from Equine Guelph? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can. Great, Susan. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Susan from Equine Guelph uh, was going to speak to us about uh, uh, the uh, large animal emergency rescue course. So I'll hand it over to you, Susan. Thank you. Yes, so thank you very much for having me. Um, yes, I wanted to update the group that we have run another large animal emergency rescue course that's um, targeted mainly for first responders. Uh, we ran it at the beginning of October. It was our third offering at the Meaford Fire Department in Ontario. Um, we had representation from eight different fire departments and as well as um, members of the Hamilton Mounted Police Unit also attended as participants. Um, it ran very well and we had uh, a number of different trainers from various fire departments and as well as OSPCA um, did some presentations. Um, and uh, as a result of some of the information from this course but also from other initiatives we're going to be putting together a online course uh, that should be offered um, later in the winter um, targeted for horse owners and others on um, fire prevention and emergency preparedness. And in addition to that, we'll be putting together a online kit available for fire departments who want to host um, um, some kind of hands-on course directed to uh, farm owners and horse owners in their different areas so that they can, we'll give them the resources and tools in case they want to carry on and do their own hands-on um, emergency preparedness and fire prevention courses for um, owners in their own area. Um, we also plan in 2019 
to run uh, more of the large animal rescue courses within Ontario. Um, we haven't yet identified the locations or the dates, but um, we will be planning either spring and fall of next year. Um, anyone who's interested, I encourage you to either you can send me an email or on our website um, contact us and I'll make sure that you get the right information. And I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end of the uh, call. Great, great. Thank, 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 thank you, Susan. That's uh, that's awesome. awesome. Christy, is there uh, anything else on our agenda, or can we open this up for uh, questions and discussion?